Hello, and it's the fourth episode of Delving Into Academics. It's a podcast where we interview researchers in physics, chemistry and biology about what they're currently working on and their life as an academic. For this episode, Professor James Dunlop tells us a bit about his research into early galaxies and how he became an academic. I hope you enjoy it. So today I am here with Professor James Dunlop. He's a professor of extragalactic astronomy at the University of Edinburgh, but started out doing a Bachelor of Science in Physics at the University of Dundee. He then did a PhD in Astronomy at the University of Edinburgh, and then became a lecturer and went on to become a senior lecturer in astrophysics at the University of Central Lancashire. He was then a reader at the Liverpool John Moores University and then came back to the University of Edinburgh to become a reader and then professor and then took a year gap to become Canada Research Chair at the University of British Columbia. He then came back to the University of Edinburgh to be a professor again and is now the current head of school for physics and astronomy here. Thank you so much for joining us. You're very welcome. So how about we start with what are you currently researching? So my research for a long time now has been about the evolution of galaxies with a connection to cosmology because by studying galaxies and the ages of the stars in the galaxies you can infer other important things like how old the universe has to be to contain these objects. And I guess in recent years we've been pushing back time with the the great advantage of astronomy being that you can actually look back in time because of the time that the light takes to come to us. So roughly speaking or fairly precisely speaking the universe is now known to be 13.8 billion years old give or take a few tens of million years and in recent years with ground-based telescopes the Hubble Space Telescope in particular which staggers on despite being quite old now and we would hope in the next couple of years with the James Webb Space Telescope, which is due to be launched in 2021, we've been pushing back, looking further and further back at time to see when the first galaxies formed, simply speaking. At some point, objects must have formed from the very smooth universe that was left after the Big Bang. And these first objects would be stars or clusters of stars that grew rapidly into galaxies. And observationally, we've now pushed this back to within about half a billion years of the Big Bang. So more than 95% of the way back in the history of the universe, we can still see galaxies. So we still haven't seen the first galaxies. So if you wanted a simple message as to what I do, we're looking for the first galaxies to track the origins of galaxy formation. Wow, that sounds so fascinating, the fact that you can look back so far now. I mean, that's quite incredible. And you still haven't found the first galaxies, but I guess, they started quite early on in the universe. Yeah, and and quite a lot earlier than maybe some theorists would have predicted. Under some models of structure formation, there would be a a much bigger delay before gravity could get to work and actually produce these things. And partly it's been technology driven. It used to be that people couldn't see galaxies beyond a certain distance because the light was redshifted out of the optical. And so for a while, people didn't know if there weren't galaxies beyond a certain distance or look back time, as we say or whether it was just a technical limitation. And when they put good infrared cameras onto the Hubble Space Telescope, we found that it basically had been a technical limitation and armed with infrared cameras, we could see to higher redshifts because the most distant galaxies are also going quickly away from us. And so their light is Doppler shifted into the near infrared. And now basically we're waiting for the James Webb Space Telescope to take us further to the red to see if, if where we think the most distant galaxies are now is the edge or whether we can see b- back a, a bit further yet. Another interesting thing is the galaxies we've discovered at these very early times, we know they're not the first galaxies because we can actually see in their spectra the imprint of elements like iron and carbon and 
oxygen, which can only have been produced by still earlier generations of stars. So in a perfect world, the first galaxies would consist of stars made out of hydrogen and helium left after the Big Bang. And with the weirdness of astronomy naming things backwards, these earliest stars are called population three stars, whereas the sun is a population one star. So the search for these population three stars, or galaxies made up of these population three stars, it's still a search, we haven't seen them yet. Uh, it sounds quite cool, and you've done quite a lot of observational work so far, and looking at these, well, the earlier galaxies that we can see, so what have you been able to kind of infer from looking at these galaxies, even though they're not the first galaxies, into how they were formed? Well, they may not be the first galaxies, but they are very early galaxies, and they, we already know they don't look like present-day galaxies. Okay, so they're a lot smaller. A big galaxy like our Milky Way would be formed over more or less the whole history of the universe through a mixture of mergers of small galaxies and then more accreted gas, making the big disk of the Milky Way galaxy that we see today. So when we see the first galaxies that we see with the Hubble Space Telescope, of the earliest galaxies, we're basically seeing the building blocks of what today are probably some of the most giant galaxies in the universe after they all merge together. So we see subunits, but they're still fairly substantial subunits. We're seeing things of a mass, maybe a few billion times the mass of the Sun. So they're still fairly substantial, but maybe about a hundred times smaller than the mass of the Milky Way. So if you look today, they would be deemed dwarf galaxies, but they, at that early time, they're more like the typical size of, of galaxies. So we know they're fairly small, compact objects, but we can tell, as I said a minute ago, either from their colours, just how blue or red they are, crudely speaking, or with a lot of effort, you can take a spectrum and, and split up the light to look for individual features in the spectrum, which might tell you about their elements. So we also know that the galaxies we've seen so far already have second generation elements, not just hydrogen and helium in them. They're not as metal, we call these things, astronomers call anything that's not just hydrogen, helium or lithium, they call them metals. But basically that just means most of the things in the periodic table. These things have to be formed inside massive stars. And so the fact that traces of these can be seen in the spectrum of these galaxies means that there's been earlier generations. But they're not as metal rich as present day galaxies. So there is a history of more and more generations of stars over cosmic time generating more and more of the, the elements you see in the chemistry periodic table. So a summary would be low metallicity, but not zero metallicity, not population three primordial galaxies, fairly compact objects that would be the progenitors of today's massive galaxies. These types of, well, I guess the very earliest types of galaxies, how you mentioned using spectroscopy to test their hydrogen and helium only. But what would they appear like? Would they be even smaller than the early galaxies we're seeing now? Or would they look similar to a Milky Way? Or well, they wouldn't look different? anything like a Milky Way, probably. I mean, they'd probably be... Even some of these early galaxies do look sort of disc-like, because as the, as the gas collapses down to make a structure, the angular momentum tends to make it flatten into a rotating disc. So they, they, they are small disk galaxies, but they don't have the grand, well-developed spiral arms that you see of giant galaxies in the, in the present-day universe. What would be the difference between the first galaxies and the ones we've seen so far? If they really didn't have any metals like iron or carbon or oxygen, they would be very blue. In fact, there's a pretty clear prediction that how much bluer they would be than most galaxies we've seen so far. Because young stars are blue, and if you don't have these elements in the atmospheres of the star to, to redden their colour a bit, then they would be kind of pure blue light. And also, if you don't have the elements like carbon and silicon things, then you don't have any cosmic dust, which is also a thing that reddens a lot of the present day galaxies. I mean, with the naked eye, when you look up at the night sky, you don't actually see very far into the disk of the Milky Way. You see a small fraction and then there's actually too much cosmic dust. And so that's another reason you would like to go far to the red, because the further you go to the red, the less obscured the light is, and therefore you see the pure starlight. So the first galaxies would be very small, very blue, dust-free objects. And beyond that, we just know that they're probably going to be small and faint, and therefore not just far away, but intrinsically 
quite low luminosity and therefore you need to have very sensitive telescopes to see them. And so the way you try and see them is either go to space, you know, to get past some of the obscuring effects of the Earth's atmosphere, or build an absolutely enormous telescope on the ground, which is happening both in Hawaii, where the 30 metre telescope is being built by Caltech, and there's also a thing called the Giant Magellan Telescope being built by Carnegie and other un consortium of universities in Chile. And also in Chile is this European, unimaginatively named, extremely large telescope. So this is the E <laughs> for European, the EELT, which is basically a 40 metre telescope that's being constructed right now high in the Andes. Now, these ground-based telescopes still suffer a bit from some problems because you still get the atmosphere. But in terms of just collecting a massive amount of light and trying to make a sharp, high-resolution image, they can do some things that you can't do from space because, we, well, maybe ne never, but it'll be a long time before we can put a 40-metre diameter telescope into space just because of the cost. So it's a mixture of big ground-based facilities or things like the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be about three times bigger than the Hubble Space Telescope and see further to the red. So you have to begin, in, in this game, to use whatever facilities can get you to your science objectives. Different wavelengths, even extending to radio, far infrared, infrared, UV, it's a kind of multi-frequency observational research project. Yeah, absolutely, and there seems to be a lot of <laughs> development in the equipment used to observe these, well, I guess further and further back in time and to observe greater distances as well. And James Webb Space Telescope has been one that seems to excite a lot of people in different areas of uh, astrophysics, let alone to see these very early galaxies. So what are you kind of hoping that the James Webb Telescope will bring that perhaps hasn't been able to by previous telescopes? Well, the key thing it can do which really you can't do from the ground, is see further into the near and what people call the mid-infrared. So we're talking here about, from the ground, people build telescopes that see to what's called the K-band, which is basically a wavelength of light about two microns. Okay, So that's, if you think of the optical being, I don't know, our eyes can see from about 400 nanometers to maybe about 700 nanometers. So the K-band is about three times that wavelength of what we call red, so it's, it's infrared. And beyond that, from the ground, the atmosphere, just the molecules in the atmosphere, absorb so much infrared light that you can, and, and emit lots of background infrared light that you can't really operate from the ground. Now, you might think Hubble being in space was fine for that as well, but actually Hubble was in a very low Earth orbit because it was put there by the shuttle, and fortunately serviceable by the shuttle after Hubble turned out to be broken when it first went up. And actually, it's in such a low Earth orbit that if anyone, you can go and calculate what its orbit must be, if you like, from the knowledge that it goes around the Earth every 90 minutes or so. So it's actually zipping around the Earth at a very low Earth orbit, much lower than a geostationary satellite or something like that. Now, one downside of that is it's still actually bathed in some of the warmth from the Earth, from the glow from the Earth's surface. And the other thing is the telescope itself, partly as a result of that, is not particularly cold. And so Hubble doesn't really see much further to the infrared than you can see from the ground. In fact, slightly less. It's deliberately designed not to be able to see past about a wavelength of 1.6 microns, what astronomers call the H-band. Now, James Webb Space Telescope, people sometimes call it a big Hubble telescope, but it's kind of different because it's going to be sent about a million miles away from the Earth into a, a stable orbit outside the Earth, but tracking around with it in what's called Lagrangian point two. So there's places in the solar system where Things can be parked. Well, you need some adjuster rockets to make sure they don't fall off the saddle point, but they can be parked there and go around in sync with the Earth so we can keep talking to the telescope by radio links. But that has some advantages. It's sufficiently far away from the Earth and other things that with its big sun shield, it will cool down to much lower temperatures. And so then you can operate an infrared camera in a much lower background when you're trying to see infrared light from distant sources. You don't want it to be swamped by the infrared light in the camera, the heat, if you like. The disadvantage is, if it doesn't work, we're not just going to be able to nip out there and fix it without designing some new spacecraft and sending astronauts a million miles away to see what's going on. So it, the thing it'll do that really will probably never be rivaled from the ground is, is seeing further to the infrared 
but still with good image quality because it's a big enough telescope. And in principle, that means we can push back to what people call higher redshifts, which is longer look back times, so back further. But it also means we can see, obviously, if all the light is being redshifted, so the UV gets redshifted to the optical and the optical gets redshifted to the infrared. If you can see far enough to the infrared, you can actually look at the rest frame optical light because at the moment all we can see is the rest frame ultraviolet light from these early galaxies. So then you can do a proper comparison about what early galaxies look like in the normal optical that we're used to seeing galaxies in the present day. And that's where a lot of the features like oxygen lines and carbon lines that you might want to check out are to be found. So for the first time we'll see a rest frame optical view of the first galaxies to compare with our optical view that we've had for a long time of the present day universe. Right, and so what would these rest frame optical views provide in sort of the information that they will contain about that galaxy and what you can kind of infer about that galaxy? Well, it will just be a more representative view of what the galaxy is made of. So the furthest away galaxies we've seen so far, if I can put some jargon into this interview, basically we've seen to about what people call a redshift of 10 which means that you see the light stretched in wavelength by a factor of 1 plus the redshift, so by a factor of about 11 or so. So when we look in the near infrared now at high redshift, which is how we detect these things, we're actually seeing the rest frame ultraviolet. We're seeing light of a rest frame wavelength of something around Lyman Alpha, so about 150 nanometers, say. Really, really extreme UV has been shifted right through the optical then into the near infrared and only with near infrared detectors do we see these objects so we've got a bizarre situation where we use near infrared technology but for the most distant galaxies all we're seeing is the uv light the ultraviolet light from these objects now what in any galaxy most of the ultraviolet light is made by a small gang of very massive short-lived stars that emit a lot of light in the uv and so what they're doing isn't necessarily that in indicative of what most of the galaxy is made of. So if you can see further to the red and see the rest frame optical, and maybe even a bit of the rest frame near infrared, you will see the light from the stars that actually dominate the mass of the galaxy. So at the moment we're seeing these things, we're going, so you know the galaxy is there, you know it's got some young hot stars in it producing the UV light, but you don't actually know what sort of stars make up most of the mass of that galaxy. So it will be a fairer census of the kind of starlight that makes up these galaxies we'll get from infrared. Okay, that would be quite interesting to see the different makeup of these earlier galaxies. Yeah, and if, if there are some galaxies, I mean, it's so early time that most of these galaxies are in some sense young. But if there are some galaxies that have switched off star formation, we might see things with Webb that you can't see with Hubble at all because they're not producing much UV light at that epoch. So there are, it's possible there's a bunch of galaxies sort of temporarily switched off that we'll see with James Webb that you just can't see with current facilities at all. I think once you're back within half a billion years of the Big Bang, some level, most galaxies are probably young and active because they're still forming stars as lots of gas. But if you wanted to make a complete census of what kind of galaxies are around a few hundred million years after the Big Bang, then the James Webb Space Telescope should provide that. If it works, it's a big, t it's a, it's carries on board the instruments of real complexity and it's not like a normal observatory, as I said, that somebody can fix something if it just doesn't start working. So it's going to be a scary few weeks as it heads off there. You know, the mirror has to unfold because the mirror has to fold up to fit into the biggest launch rockets we've got at the moment. And then this huge sun shield the size of a tennis court has to unravel like some kind of pop-up tent. And all of this has to happen automatically without any hinge getting caught or with any screw going loose. So we'll see. But if you're going to make an advance in this area, then this is the sort of machine you have to build. I mean, it's long overdue. There's been lots of technical issues. Not with the instruments, actually. The instruments are sitting on the ground ready to go. And one of the three instruments has been co-led from Edinburgh. That's the mid-infrared camera. So there's a thing called NERCAM, which is a near-infrared camera. A thing called NERSPEC which unsurprisingly is the near-infrared spectrograph. And then there's MIRI, which is the mid-infrared instrument, does imaging and spectroscopy. And it has been co-led from, from here in Edinburgh and from Arizona. So we've a stake in this facility as well. And so these three instruments have actually been ready to go for a while, while other problems with the telescope, the sun shield, engineering issues have, have held the project up. So 
just last year we were nearly submitting proposals for the telescope and then we were told to postpone again so i think it's uh, march 2021 is the launch window so hopefully it won't postpone again. i mean it will happen now most of it's being final tested and all instruments are there so but then there'll be a few weeks as it journeys out to its this site because it's so far away and then there'll be a shakedown period of several months where we'll check that everything's working and then we'll get going and it's meant to have a lifetime of between five and ten years basically depending on how long the, the fuel that's required to use the small rockets to keep it in at the right place and point it in the right direction how long that lasts will determine its lifetime yeah, wow. Well, I mean, it has been postponed for quite a while, but I know it's one of the probably more anticipated developments out there that everyone's kind of wanting to get, yeah, this, get this, going. Yeah, this is not going to be an incremental advance. If, it, if everything works, it will be at least as transformative as the Hubble Space Telescope was. Mm. But, I mean, at some level, you have to be moderately sanguine about these things. At some level, all these projects run over. I mean, I can't remember the timescale, but Hubble itself was way late compared to what people said it would be. And at some point, you've just got to persist. And the, the real problem with them running late is just that it's not so much that, you know, we can wait in astronomy for another couple of years. Although individual people can be a bit affected. I've got a PhD student just finishing now whose original PhD project should have involved some data from the James Webb Space Telescope. But you'll probably carry on and do a postdoc and still get data from the James Webb telescope. But, so individual people can be affected. Some people involved in you know the mission are retired now. And, but the main problem is that you know the, the expense racks up because all the time you're not finished and still testing, you're still paying people to to do work in the telescope. It doesn't cost as much as a nuclear submarine, so we should, <laughs> we should probably all relax. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, and I guess the discoveries that can be made from this will go on to inspire other people as well to go on and study physics and become more involved in space and potentially develop. You would hope so. I mean, I think I've been quite lucky. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years, for goodness sake. That 30 years, not every subject's advancing a lot at the moment, and astronomy has. And it's been a technology-driven advancement because it's benefited from advances in detectors. You know, if you go back, about the time I was doing my PhD in the in the late 1980s was the first time we ever had an infrared camera. And actually, some of that technology had come from tanks and nighttime vision things. And at the same time, if you think of what computing advances, you know, the ability to store data and analyse data at speed and download data, that's been important. Cryogenics has been important because these cameras, I mean, I've done a lot of work with what's called SCUBA and SCUBA 2. These are submillimeter cameras. They've got to be cooled by helium-3, helium-4 dilution fridges down to about 0.1 Kelvin to work. So, you know, if you want to build one of these facilities, you need to assemble scientists in, who know what you want to do and are aware enough of the field to project 10 years ahead what will still be competitive for that facility to do. You need engineers who understand high-level, fast and efficient, energy-efficient computing if you're going to put detectors on board a remote facility that just is, you know, it's going to run off solar power. You need people who understand low-level cryogenics. You need people who understand how to control and direct these things, and then you need to organise all this, so you need people who also understand systems engineering and things like this. So there's lots of areas. We attract a lot of engineers to work in front-level astronomy who may go back into industry but come in to do something that's cutting edge, maybe not as well paid as in an industry project, but where it'll be quite high-risk high gain engineering to try and make the first detector that can do this or the first ever instrument that can point to this precision all this kind of stuff i mean a lot of the some of the things that are put into these detectors for example a modern spectrograph you try to get light from many different objects and that usually involves robotic arms that can steer and steer around each other and not bash into each other to pick off the bit of the sky that you want the light from so it's technology driven but it's not just about detecting light it's about all the infrastructure to build an instrument that has a long life that can do something you've not been able to do before but particularly if you're going to pour all this money in and send it into space you have to be pretty confident that it's robust engineering as well so it needs to be new but not too new you don't want to put on gwst some detector that nobody knows if it will work 
so you can try more cutting edge things from the ground once you put something into space it needs to be kind of space proven if you like something that they think is new but proven technology before you invest in sending it a million miles away for 10 years sorry that was a bit of a ramble but <laughs> trying to paint a picture of how much technology has driven astronomy over the last 30 years you know more advances than many other areas of physics i think over that time yeah exactly and it's interesting to get the background behind what goes into creating these types of instruments because i mean you look in the last yeah, a couple of decades. The developments that have been happening in technology nowadays are just phenomenal. I mean, this year is the anniversary of the first moon landing. Mm-hmm. So from that stage, and then you kind of go through and what astronomy can do now, and what we can do. What's slightly now. scary is when you watch these moon landing things, and to my shame, I guess I, I was seven when the moon landing took place, so I do actually remember it. But uh, they had no technology. I mean, they actually went to the moon with a lot less computing power than is in the phone we are recording this on right now, which is, some would say, crazy. Uh, and there, uh, there can't have been any health and safety assessment worth its name done for the moon landings. That's but, you know, that slight, space exploration and astronomy are slightly different things, but to some extent, all the time, people use it as a frontier to push and try new technologies. Not always with putting human life on the line as much as the Apollo missions. But, you know, for a while, these two things do intersect. You know, for a long time, we were waiting for this near-infrared camera to go on Hubble, not because the camera wasn't ready, but because there'd been the, the shuttle disaster. And there was a long debate about whether they would ever fly the shuttle to make the final refurbishing mission for the Hubble Space Telescope. And in the end, it was only uh, approved after quite a lot of pressure from certain senior astronauts, astronauts, not astronomers, who believed in, you know, they'd been involved in refurbishing Hubble before, who believed that this was important enough for humanity, inspiring science, whatever, that they were prepared to take the risk to go and do it. And it was done with a second shuttle being ready on the launch pad in case something went wrong with the first shuttle and people had to go to the space station, you know. So there are times that astronomy and astronautics, if you like, have intersected and Thankfully, nobody's actually been killed trying to fix the Hubble Space Telescope, but the last shuttle disaster did then delay the refurbishment of that telescope until people developed the willpower or the safety network to make it happen. Yes, and then we've kind of developed from there, instead of sending men up to refurbish this with the James Webb Telescope, as we said, it's, it's almost too far to do that kind of thing is that kind of where we're heading to a more technological based well sending telescopes out there that are a bit more tech based than human based it's not so much much tech based i mean i guess hubble was like a a telescope hubble was unusual because it was an attempt to put a telescope into space which was going to have such a long life and was so varied in what it could do that it was more like a ground-based telescope. You know, it had various instruments and then it was planned that you could change and update these instruments. James Webb, in a way, is more like how space missions have traditionally been. There's been quite a few space missions which are just sent up and nobody ever expects to go and fix it. You know, all the X-ray satellites so far have been just missions, not observatories. You know, they've got one, a few instruments, an expected lifetime. Nobody expects to go and fix it. And out at Lagrangian Point 2, where James Webb is going, there already are two telescopes out there, Planck, famous telescope in recent years which mapped the microwave background. Publications are still coming out. The ultimate cosmology mission, it's there, but you know, its its instruments are well defined, robust, nobody's meant to fix them. It's worked perfectly. And the Herschel Space Observatory, which is a far infrared mission, again doing a sky surveys, various sky surveys in the far infrared, never designed to be fixed, never designed to be upgraded never has been worked fine. So in some ways James Webb is more like one of what I would call a mission rather than a a multi-purpose observatory. The complicated and scary thing is that people haven't been able to resist putting into James Webb quite an array of instruments which make it seem almost like something in between these dedicated relatively simple single science missions and the opposite of an observatory that you expect to tweak and fix and upgrade and James Webb sort of in between these but still meant to work without any human intervention. So we'll see. Yeah, absolutely. And it'll be a stressful but exciting time when it finally gets going and Mm -hmm. we get those 
first results and first observations and so kind of on the more how astronomy or astrophysics is going to develop particularly with looking at these early galaxies and such how do you think it will develop in the future and what do you think we should expect to find from improving and making more developments and coming up with new theories and such that's a broad question (laughs) um So I think after James Webb, but then we're still talking probably a decade away, research in very early galaxies could slow down. You know, it might be that we don't have too much further to go in terms of cosmic time. So we'll see some objects a little bit earlier and a bit further away than we do now. And we'll certainly learn a lot more about the galaxies we've already discovered at that epoch for the reasons that I said about seeing the rest frame optical. We'll be able to measure the masses to much greater precision and their elemental abundances. If we don't see, you know, a first virginal galaxy if you like if i can use that phrase made up of pop three stars at that time then it may be actually it's just very difficult to ever see that because some people feel that phase will be unbelievably short-lived because if the first stars are very massive and there's reasons to it's theoretical reasons to expect that to be the case because of the cooling of gas clouds that only contain hydrogen and helium they, they cool in a different way to a gas cloud in our own milky way that loses a lot of its heat through emission from dust and molecules it helps it collapse in the early universe with no dust or molecules apart from hydrogen molecules the the genes mass the mass at which things fragment into individual objects and start to produce stars is much higher so a lot of theoretical p- predictions would say that the first stars these pure stars made of hydrogen and helium might be 100 200 solar mass stars in which case they'll have incredibly short lives they may make these elements but they'll go supernova really really quickly possibly leaving behind black holes quickly enriching the interstellar medium so that immediately and that if that's a very short-lived phase as very as well as being a very early phase your chances of capturing a galaxy that is purely pop three stars may, may be almost nil you know maybe just one little patch in it and then the rest of it's already enriched from the ejector so we'll see that we won't see that we will be able to put some final constraints i think on when the first galaxies form because james webb in principle can all see all the way to range of 30 you know so to within a time in the universe was was just one or two percent of of its present age so that'll be exciting the other thing that's going on is the other facilities i'm mainly involved in i'm I'm also heavily involved in i mentioned earlier sub millimeter and millimeter wave astronomy which is also looking at even further to the red but actually is a lot focused on dust and metals and over the next few years a couple of facilities and uh, an instrument called scuba 2 that's on the james clark maxwell telescope and that instrument was built in edinburgh it's still the world's most powerful sub millimeter camera and then there's a giant array telescope called alma the atacama large millimeter array which sits in the atacama desert it's like one of these radio telescopes with lots of different antenna that can be linked together but it also observes in the millimetre, and it can make incredibly sharp images in millimetre wavelengths, both in dust emission, the light from dust emission, or the light from molecules, mainly molecules like carbon monoxide and things like that. So there's this other window in the universe that's the, on the atomic and molecular cool universe. And so as well as looking for these first galaxies, we can use ALMA to look at these galaxies and, and get another view as to whether they contained any cold dust and what kind of molecules. And you can actually measure the dynamics of these galaxies from these kind of observations, how quickly they're rotating and things, and get independent measures of their masses. So a full kind of multi-frequency picture of the cold and the hot constituents of these galaxies should be achievable over the next 10 years again not by saying i am a millimeter astronomer or by saying i am an ultraviolet astronomer which would be the traditional view but just saying i'm an astronomer that wants to understand early galaxy formation what facilities do i need to do that and so these facilities alm is still relatively new it's only last year that the last few antenna came online james webb will obviously be new a few years later we can expect this extremely large telescope to start work so we can look to another 10 or 20 years of very observational and technology-led development of what early galaxies looked like and strangely these same facilities that are interested in looking in the infrared and in molecules and things will also be used closer to home to look at how planets formed around other stars so when you look at the science cases for things like the james webb space telescope strangely the two main drivers are very long time ago the sort of stuff i'm doing in the early universe and right here and now looking for how planets might have formed out of 
dust and gas around stars, both of which are in infrared, but for very different reasons. The dust and gas disks that made planets are in infrared because they're actually very cool, whereas the early galaxies you're looking in infrared because they're actually probably quite hot, but the light's been redshifted into the infrared, so nowadays it looks cool. And at some level, if you look at what the public are interested in, these are two areas that capture people's imagination, I suppose, because they're both about creation. You know, We are looking for when the first elements responsible for life, if you like, were made in a cosmological context. But people are also interested in how did planets like our Earth form out of these kind of elements? Not nowadays, but in more recent time. I mean, the Earth's about four and a half billion years old, I suppose. So it's about a third of the age of the, of the universe. And they're both uh, creation facts rather than creation myths that people are under, are interested in. You know, so people sometimes write whole science cases under this creation banner if they think it, you know, will catch people's imagination. So there are two areas of creation, you know, first stars and elements, planets. And then the other thing that people are always interested in is the kind of ultimate creation question of cosmology, how did the universe come to be, what was a Big Bang, really difficult questions at the edge of physics and philosophy, like what came before the Big Bang, were there many Big Bangs and things like that. And not saying we'll answer these questions, but the other main area in astrophysics where a lot of facilities are being built are to further try and advance our understanding of cosmology, by which I mean the overall framework of the universe. And as I said at the beginning, we are doing some things of relevance to cosmology, you know, it, one of the most interesting things, which people kind of take for granted, but I think is quite surprising, is if you work out the age of the universe from pure cosmology, you know, how, how quickly it's expanding nowadays and looking at the dynamics of the universe and running the clock back, you can say that the universe is about 14 billion years. If you look at the oldest stars and, and galaxies in the universe today and apply nuclear physics and run your models of stellar evolution back, you find that the oldest things contained in the universe today are about 13, 14 billion years old. Now, people might say, well, that sounds a bit rough, but there are such different areas of physics that at some level that proves that we're doing things along the right lines, that the universe appears to be roughly the right age to contain the oldest stars that anyone's ever found within it based on nuclear physics. And in that era, in that kind of age, age of understanding cosmology, we've now got to the point from facilities like Planck, from studies of the microwave background, but obviously from large-scale galaxy surveys as well as understanding the makeup of the universe. So you see these kind of pie charts that tell you what the universe is made of. So about 5% of it turns out to be normal matter, and then you get a quarter of the universe being cold dark matter, which we know is there, but nobody knows what it is. And then the rest of the universe is the stuff that people call dark energy, which is accelerating the expansion of the universe. And, and these num the, the fractions, I can't remember off the top of my head, but you can easily Google and find the latest estimates of the fractions of dark energy, dark matter, and normal matter. And that inventory is pretty precise now. You know, these numbers are known to plus or minus a percent. So there's been this big success in cosmology in quantifying the universe. We know very accurately how fast it's expanding. We know it's accelerating. We know what its constituents are in terms of relative fractions. And so the other big quest on is to try and understand what the cold dark matter is, what dark energy is. Some of these questions might be answered by studying galaxies because galaxies live within halos of cold dark matter as far as you understand it. And things like what are the lowest mass galaxies you can find can have relevance for the nature of the dark matter. If the dark matter is really cold, you can have really tiny galaxies because the dark matter clusters into really small clumps. If the dark matter is slightly warm, there'll be a limit to the lowest mass galaxy because it diffuses out, out of these clumps. I mean, people used to talk about dark matter being neutrinos, but they're probably too hot, they're too light, so they diffuse too far and they don't get small galaxies if you try and build a universe where all the dark matter is neutrinos. But 30 years ago, people thought, well, at least we know neutrinos exist. <laughs> So let's build a universe where the dark matter is neutrinos. And so within that cosmology arena, people are building, there's a thing called the Euclid satellite that's going to fly in two or three years that's meant to try and constrain better the nature of dark matter and dark energy through large-scale galaxy surveys. So there you're studying galaxies, but more as tools to probe gravitational lensing and things in the universe. And then there's a thing called the Large Synoptic Survey Telescope, LSST, that's being built in the US. But again, we are the UK lead for here in Edinburgh. And it's going to do lots of uh, large-scale ground-based surveys. And also repeat the same surveys again and again, so you can look for moving objects and transient objects. So within cosmology, these big survey telescopes will push us on. Whether they themselves will get us any closer to the nature of dark matter or dark energy, we shall see. I mean, is that, this is where astronomy starts to intersect with particle physics. You know, People are looking for dark matter candidates at CERN. People are looking for 
to a matter candidates down deep mines, seeing things that, you know, weakly interacting particles intersect with vats of detectors down deep mines. So a lot of the future work in cosmology may involve people working in what you might call astral particle physics, where people are involved in particle physics. If CERN doesn't see many new particles after the Higgs, quite a few of these people may drift into astrophysics and cosmology to see if that can tell us any, any more about the nature of matter. Because it may be that some of the fundamentals of particle physics will only be probed by looking at cosmology, you know, and trying to infer what was going on in the Big Bang, at energies that no particle accelerator will ever reach. So more and more we have uh, like things through the Higgs Centre, the two Higgs Centres we have here in Edinburgh, the Higgs Centre for Theoretical Physics down in the James Clark Maxwell building and the Higgs Centre for Innovation up here. A lot of that is directed at bringing together physicists from particle and nuclear physics and interacting with people in, in astrophysics and cosmology who have common interests in what is the universe made of. Why is it that way? <laughs> See, and it seems like a very big question. And I did actually want to ask you, you know, maybe probing these early galaxies and looking more into galaxy formation, do you think it could tell us more about where for instance dark matter comes from because as you say like there are these halos around galaxies Mm -hmm. halos of dark matter so i mean might be a bit of a a naive question i guess no it's not um... i mean if you look at say the way the number density of these early galaxies grows with time so i've talked about discovering these early galaxies but they are much rarer than galaxies are today so you can do a census of the build-up of galaxies the galaxy population over cosmic time and you know where we are looking back at galaxies were a thousand maybe ten thousand times less common than there are today so though you can find them they're rare which is one reason it's hard work to find them and if you look at the way that the mass in stars and therefore the mass in galaxies builds up over cosmic history it's sort of exactly as you would expect if the potential wells they're growing in was dictated by cold dark matter so the same cold dark matter that's required to explain the dynamics of the universe in the larger scales also seems if you if you simulate how you would expect galaxies to form in these cold dark matter halos and the build-up of galaxies to to follow the expected build-up of their underlying dark matter halos it's kind of exactly on the money is exactly what you would like modulo the fact that there's less high mass galaxies than there are high mass dark matter halos and there's less low mass galaxies than there are low mass galaxy halos but people understand fairly well that as a galaxy forms there's a lot of feedback a lot of energy is re-injected back in through exploding stars at the faint end and through black holes which produce quasars which also are expected to eject a lot of mass so there's sort of safety valve mechanisms at the very highest masses and the very lowest masses that still need to be properly understood but around your kind of average galaxy mass the place where the milky way ends up today the growth of the number density of these objects is exactly as you expect if it's driven by the dynamics being dominated by cold dark matter as it's called and so that doesn't tell us what cold dark matter is but if galaxies had been found by observations to evolve very differently, we could have ruled out quite a lot of kinds of cold dark matter. And I would say, for example, the idea that all the dark matter is neutrinos has been ruled out by observations of galaxies, essentially. That's why we know that, because if you simulate a, a universe where the dark matter is all neutrinos, you don't get a galaxy population that looks like or has evolved like the galaxies we see do. So if you go back to the late 80s, 1990s, people still talked about hot dark matter or cold dark matter. So hot dark matter is off the table purely by 30 years of observations in cosmology. So if the answer is, do observations of normal matter galaxies are dominated the light we see is produced by normal matter it's produced by baryons and leptons can you tell us about the dark part of the universe then the answer is, at some level is yes can they tell us exactly what of the many proposed candidates of what cold dark matter is exactly what kind of particle it is maybe no but it can it, it can continue with ever increasing precision to rule out various candidates and various types of dark matter and then at the other end people you know what people call dark energy is actually this thing that I would argue has been predicted from a long time ago, which is Einstein's cosmological constant, just a, a repulsive factor in the fundamental theory of gravity. And people don't like that idea for, for reasons that I and quite a lot of physicists don't necessarily understand, because at the moment all the observations suggest that that thing just is 
cosmological constant. Why people don't like that is I guess it's not very helpful to connect to particle physics, to just call it this thing. The cosmological constant isn't a very helpful way to connect with what the nature of that force field might be. And so maybe dark energy feels like a better route towards connecting it to, to particle physics. But at the moment, as far as people can see, that, that thing, whether you call it the cosmological constant or vacuum energy density or dark energy, that thing at the moment seems to be the simplest relatively non-evolving thing that probably is kind of similar to Einstein's predicted cosmological constant. But lots of people get upset about not knowing what it is, and they get upset about its value, which is quite low and isn't predicted by anything. And they say kind of stupid things about it. It's 137 orders of magnitude smaller than predicted by particle physics. But at some level, that's a completely stupid comment, because if it had been 137 orders of magnitude bigger, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So that's that's ruled out even by anthropic arguments about physics, about, you know, physics has to look like it does within certain parameters or we couldn't be having this podcast. So it's going to be interesting. So we're kind of now in the era of precision studies of galaxies and precision cosmology. And the question will be, will 10 or 20 years of coming extra precision, which is going to happen, is that just going to just push the error bars down a bit more and, and we're going, yeah, we live in a cold dark matter universe with a cosmological constant with galaxies evolving as we expected? Or is it going to produce some huge upset? Like, is this mix of cold dark matter and dark energy completely wrong and we've misunderstood gravity somehow? So that could also happen, but at the moment, the sort of tensions that would require that to emerge, you know, the sort of tensions that emerge at various points in physics that cause a huge upheaval, not seeing them yet. But maybe two or three, a factor of two or three increase in precision will reveal them. You know, there's something people have got quite excited about recently, that the Hubble constant, you know, the thing that basically determines how fast the universe is expanding. There's some tension between the value of the Hubble constant based on studies of supernova and the end of values of Hubble constant from studies of the microwave background. But at the moment, it's a kind of two, three sigma tension, whereas 20 years ago, it was like out by a factor of two different methods to get the Hubble constant. So now they agree to within, you know, some people would say the Hubble constant's 65 kilometers per second per megaparsec and other people would say it's 57 and 20 years ago people would go hurrah problem solved that's agreement but now people are looking for if you believe people's error bars that's that's maybe a three sigma tension i'm cynical about that i would say that's going to turn out to be the same number because people's ability to estimate their systematic errors is traditionally rubbish but if that tension proved to be real then that would be interesting and, and if you found that dark energy doesn't quite behave like it's as expected for the cosmological constant. In other words, the vacuum energy has some dependence on cosmological time rather than just being another number, then that would be a window to, to new physics. So we'll see. At the moment, it's all... In the same way that the standard model of particle physics has proved remarkably resilient since the discovery of the W and Z boson and measurement of their masses and the prediction of the Higgs, and the Higgs comes out to be the, the simplest Higgs you could think. The cosmological constant has turned out to be the simplest version of the cosmological constant, as predicted by Einstein, even though he kind of retracted it for silly reasons. Even Einstein had his bad days, right? <laughs> so it's an interesting time because the models seem to be the simplest version of the models we could have. And in some ways that's great. In some ways people are frustrated because they would like a window into new physics. So we're entering this precision era in cosmology and astronomy where I don't expect the huge leaps that we've made in the last 20 or 30 years. The Hubble constant, I'll just give you one example. Nobody knows what it is to within a factor of two. We used to we used to write it in the papers as uncertain little h so that people could write 0.5 or 1 into that for their favoured value of little h. Right? Don't do that anymore. So that's known to within a few percent. You know, people used to speculate what the mass of the Higgs boson was to within orders of magnitude. Don't do that anymore. So it, it's big experiments precision measurements, often involving huge teams of people. I mean, astrophysics is now getting a bit like particle physics. These Euclid experiments in LSST have got consortiums with thousands of astronomers on it, and people are arguing about what order the authors will be in these papers, the way particle physics has been probably for 20 years, you know, which is interesting challenges for how a, a young researcher makes their name in the field. I mean, when I entered astronomy, you could write one author papers, two author papers. You could have breakthroughs with only two or three people on it. It would have the front page of nature. James Webb might still allow a bit of that, but these big cosmology experiments certainly don't. The advances are going to be so subtle, require such large data sets, 
such large teams of people having contributed to it that it's becoming a culturally a different form of science which people have to understand before they go into it. It'd be hard in, in modern day observational cosmology to write a paper with only a few people on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 2,000 people on it and your, re- your reference from whoever leads the project that you did something real important in that project may be the key thing for your next job rather than getting a, a two-author paper out of it. So for some people that's fine, for other people that's a bit frightening and you might want to get into an area of astronomy which is still so new. Exoplanet science is a bit like that, but it won't be long before it's large-scale surveys for exoplanets involving teams of hundreds of people again, and so a lot of modern observational science involves making sure people can organise these consortia properly to make sure that everyone gets appropriate credit, that people feel comfortable working in these these areas. So there's there's a cultural change that comes with big facilities with many people and this incremental sounds like a bad word, but this precision era means trying to get your error bars down by a factor of two, rather than being the first person to ever see a distant galaxy or the first person to see a planet around another star. That, I think that's why I still quite like working at this galaxy frontier, because it's still possible that with James Webb we might have as simple a headline as first generation galaxy found. That kind, mm-hmm. of, that kind of big, sexy advance might, might still be possible, so we'll see. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds quite an exciting time to be in physics, whether it's with the James Webb telescope or with, you know, maybe finding how dark matter connects into all of it, whether it has implications elsewhere as well. It's kind of, especially as, you know, someone who's just finished their second year, is still kind of an undergraduate, seeing all these types of developments. Mm -hmm. And even if it is just making those measurements a bit more precise and that might lead to other theories getting either credited or maybe yeah. rejected or you know, developments there as well. And it's really cool to <laughs> look at all this and be like, oh, that could be me in what, like, a few years time doing this type of research and entering into this kind of world. And like you said, it has kind of culturally shifted over the years to become this big more collaborative effort between scientists and many many which, different which doesn't scientists. mean you can't find your own niche within that to make a, a specific mm-hmm. contribution you know it's a, we still have to for example even within these big consortia find ring fenced enough areas of research for people to get their own phds and things like that and so that needs to be managed because otherwise how can you get excited about you know it's, it's hard to get excited about contributing to a team of a thousand people but so what you look for is a balance where a, a, a research student can feel part of that big thing so they know they're doing something that's important because if you find something that involves too few people then that's probably because it's not important so you want to be involved at the research frontier but you also want to feel that your contribution matters and that's that requires thought and that requires good research supervisors maybe we're straying into the further bit of your podcast but you know looking at at finding projects making sure that there's a career track out of that project that makes you confident you can be involved in the research frontier but doing something you feel you have ownership of that you can feel proud of and have some control over as well as contributing to the bigger project and that's doable that, that's how all these projects advance if people are not motivated by their own research then the projects don't advance but making sure people understand what's theirs what they should share how they can contribute to other areas of the project is also important so it's partly a management thing but it's got to be management informed by excitement about the science or, or it's sterile management that just feels a bit tedious so you want to avoid that as well yeah absolutely like there's definitely got to be that interest that intrigue and curiosity that really drives quite a lot of people to become scientists and to continue on in the field because you know there are these massive questions like how do galaxies Mm -hmm. form where does you know what type of particle could dark matter be what is dark energy exactly like these are the types of questions that people will be looking at and think oh i've really got to know the answer to these well, like i've got to I find was, out i was like people and this is not just scientists but actually the general public you, you divide in once you're talking about something like cosmology i think um there's two responses it's either maybe the most important thing the human race has ever done or the least important thing the human race has ever done right? and I, there's not really much middle ground because you either think you know this is the culmination of civilization you know the 
originally you could spare a few people who didn't just need to kill the mammoth but could do some drawings in the cave wall or could look at the stars and the, the point of civilization is to free up some people hopefully not too many people and hopefully really good people who will be funded to do pure blue skies research as it's called and actually I would take the view that maybe most people would agree that you need some of that, otherwise life's too boring and what's the point? Equally, you can find lots of people who say, well, what's the point of understanding the first half billion years of the universe? All of that money should go towards cancer research or something like that. And then you get into the sort of interesting conversations you'll have with your medical colleagues in the bar at night, okay? So obviously at some level, cancer research is more important than cosmology, but what's the point of humanity if you're not trying to understand the universe? Now we're going to put all of our resources into prolonging life. So there's a balance and you've got to have that argument, but interestingly a lot of the people involved in things like medicine and maybe more applied research, these people, a lot of them were inspired into science by things like astronomy or dinosaurs that are on the face of it, not relevant to everyday life. And, you know, if we have astronomy talks, you often find that the astronomy talks you get up here for the general public, you'll find lots of people in there from chemistry and biology and medicine still interested in, in fundamental research. So society's got to decide as a, a function of GDP, I suppose, how much of this they want to go on. But actually, it's still a remarkably small fraction of GDP that goes into frontline research and a very, very small fraction that goes into this. And so I would argue... I wouldn't try to persuade people that they need to think it's important, but you probably need a bit of this going on otherwise. A, what's the point? And B, a lot of developments do eventually percolate down in a way that's very hard to predict into applied research. So you would not have had an X-ray in my lungs two weeks ago, and that X-ray was not done on film. and was done with much lower dosage than used to be the case, because X-ray detectors have developed to the point now where you need a much smaller exposure of X-rays to get your picture. It's all digital, it gets sent over, the radiographer looks at it very quickly, they don't need to hang up a film on the wall and inspect it. Why? Because X-ray astronomers once cared about every X-ray photon and developed X-ray detectors to be much more sensitive than you need in the lab. You know, why not just blast somebody with X-rays and take a photograph, right? So you get things come eventually into everyday sphere of medicine that everyone benefits from. The classic examples being X-rays or the laser, laser eye surgery. Could anyone have predicted the development of the laser? No. Towns and his gang just developed and invented the laser. So, you know, in justifying what we do, you can either appeal to the inspiring scientists generally, or you can say, well, if, if you just let a little bit of this go on, eventually on a timescale of 20 and 25 years, maybe 50 years, it will affect people's everyday life. You know, without Maxwell, you wouldn't have the mobile phone. These are always interesting arguments to have, and they don't, they don't lead you to an answer as to how much funding should go into fundamental research, but they do tell you that if you don't have some fundamental, unpredictable research going on, and accept that not ever, all of it will lead everywhere, modern technology as we know it wouldn't exist, and people's quality of life would probably be a lot poorer, and essentially all of modern diagnostic medicine wouldn't exist without physics. Yeah. So I'm just giving you some arguments to beat up <laughs> <laughs> your fellow students who ask, what the hell are you doing trying to understand galaxy formation? Okay. Yeah, so yeah, these are the types of arguments that are kind of important to put forward to society because I think the stars, they're almost like something that you, well, most people, if they're living out of cities, will be able to see or they'll have you know, first-hand experience looking up at the sky and seeing stars and stuff. But yeah, there are sometimes questions on why are we spending money studying all this kind of things? Like, where is it kind of going? But you, absolutely, it has real-world implications that don't necessarily seem like they would have come about from the initial research that kind of started it as well, mm. which is quite cool. It's yeah. quite cool to see the development. There's the different timescales and the unpredictability of it. I mean, big advances are not made by saying, I already have this technology, let's give money to this grant to make something in five years. They come from having some small number of people working in things out of pure curiosity that just spill out advances. Mm. The, other, the other thing that is worth saying that when you spend a lot of money on a space mission, remember one, I can't, one of the guys who was involved in one of the Mars rovers experiments that failed. And people said, oh, what a waste of money. And he pointed out that it wasn't like there were lots of, in this case, dollar or pound 
notes or dollar bills lying in the surface of Mars. They weren't wasted. They'd gone into employing people to build things, so that you know they paid people's wages in the same way that people's wages are paid to build a bridge. You know, when people talk about the money of the James Webb Space Telescope, the actual hardware, the thing that is you can look at, is a tiny fraction of the funds. Almost all the funds have gone in people's wages. So these are st still jobs, highly skilled jobs, and then the people funded to build the instruments presumably spent some money in the local cafe. I think people sometimes don't really understand where the money has gone, but the money has gone into employment. It's gone into high-tech employment. And a lot of it goes into training people who take these high-tech skills on into industry as well. So the actual amount of money that goes into space, you know, in terms of these detectors and th that metal or that fridge behind the camera, very small. Yeah, so, so one has to be very careful by what you mean by money spent on fundamental science. Most of it's spent in employing people in things that are arguably a lot more worthwhile than employing people at the stock exchange. <laughs> yeah. And they paid a lot less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And it's it's kind of probably one of those things that maybe the general public doesn't quite realise that quite a lot of the money spent on these types of things are for people to kind of make a living almost. Mm -hmm. And then they will go and put it into the economy of the country as well. Because, yeah, they'll exactly. go and spend it elsewhere and they'll be taxed just like everyone else. And it kind of will probably help in ways that they may not realise or think about to mm. begin with. No, exactly. So, I mean, you've given us plenty of reasons to explain why we should be doing this type of research and why we should be studying cosmology more. But what about how you got into cosmology and studying early galaxies? How did you decide that this was the area of research you wanted to go into? Uh, yes and no. Yes, but that was quite a late stage. So I became an astronomer or an astrophysicist or a cosmologist, whatever you want to call it. Not an, astro an astrologer. When you're a student and you say you're an astronomer, people ask you to predict their future or something, so you've got to be careful. That was an accident, because even doing physics was an accident. So I went to university to do architecture for two good reasons and one very bad reason. So the good reasons were that everyone else I knew leaving school was going to do a career, so nobody was just going to do more maths or geography or physics. They were off to be lawyers or doctors or civil engineers. So I got it into my head and I was advised by my teachers that I should not just carry on with an academic subject but do something more vocational. And I thought architecture looked like a mixture between art and scientists and I was a fairly all rounder. It was basically either architecture or off to the Royal College of Music. So physics wasn't even on my UCAS form. And so I went off to do architecture and realised after a couple of weeks that I wasn't that interested in buildings. And that was a fundamental flaw if you were going to be an architect. So looking back, it wasn't completely mad. I was interested in design per se and also applied for naval architecture and aerospace engineering. So I was interested in designing things in science. And so then I suddenly panicked, basically, and decided that maybe I wasn't interested enough in buildings looking at the other people in the architecture class. And I, I just decided to admit to myself I didn't have a clue what I wanted to do and that maybe I should buy myself some time and do something I knew I could do, which was physics, because I'd found physics at school. Not my favourite subject, but certainly the one that I found easiest. And so I kind of retreated and jumped sideways into physics after two weeks of architecture which probably didn't give it a fair crack of the whip. And the reason I did that was, was partly because the art college year at Dundee, architecture at Dundee was part, part university, part art college, and it started sooner. So it started two weeks before the university term, so I could still actually jump and start at university. So I went to speak to people in physics. And Dundee might not have been the per place I'd have chosen to go to if I'd decided to do physics, but I actually worked out fine because it was a fairly small class and some really good lecturers. I did a degree in physics at university and didn't really enjoy it until the third year when we got all the quantum mechanics and the relativity and all the elegant bits of theoretical physics came in and it must have appealed to the, to the artist in me that wanted to be an architect. And actually, if you look online, Murray Gelman, the famous Nobel Prize winning physicist who died two or three weeks ago, there's some interesting interviews with him on YouTube which are worth watching because he, he went to Yale 
either to do archaeology or evolutionary biology and only put physics in his application because his dad persuaded him that he needed to do something that might actually earn some money. And not comparing myself to Murray Gelman, but it's interesting, he also says he kind of stuck physics out of laziness through the early years of all the messy lab physics and all the different things you learn that just seem a bit of a interesting but quite applied and quite messy and just by luck. Well, in his case, he said laziness just stayed in it long enough to get through to this bit of physics that's suddenly beautiful. And I think one of the problems, and any, anyone who's listening to this in first and second year of physics, I would say, you know, even if you're... In my second year of physics, I played, spent all my time playing in a band and wasn't that interested in what was going on and, and somehow was glad that I stuck it because I nearly chucked it at second year, which I think is a very difficult year often as an undergraduate. You know, the initial excitement of doing physics at university is going to go on and it still seems like kind of messy school level physics you're doing tons of vector calculus and electromagnetism course seems quite brutal and if you can just stick that you'll get to a point where physics starts to seem simpler again and I think I was just lucky that I stuck it through to that point and I really really enjoyed my junior honours and senior honours there wasn't a math there wasn't an emphys in those days it was all BSc really enjoyed that loved the quantum mechanics loved the relativity didn't do any astrophysics because there was no astrophysics in Dundee. And, and at the end of my undergraduate degree, without giving you too many gory details, somebody happened to, to say, oh, I was thinking of doing astrophysics, but I'm not. Here's an astrophysics book. This was a fellow student. And they said, oh, who's this written by? And they said, oh, it's written by a guy who also did physics here at Dundee, but went on to be astronomer royal for Scotland at Edinburgh, a guy called Malcolm Longyear, who is now head of astronomy at Edinburgh and who'd left indeed to go and do physics in Cambridge actually. He's now retired but still working back at Cambridge. And so the idea that I kind of thought, okay, well there's no astrophysics here, but here's a guy who did physics at Dundee and went on to be the top astronomer in Scotland. Maybe I'll go and speak to him. So I came down to the observatory here and, and spoke to him and applied for various PhDs at Cambridge, Oxford, I think it was, and Edinburgh in astronomy, but also applied for particle physics at London and Birmingham. I, I still didn't know. Basically, I applied for the two areas of physics I'd done none of, because most of the physics done at Dundee was condensed matter, because they were the people that had invented it, made a lot of the breakthroughs in the semiconductor industry. So there were always Japanese people coming to, to worship these condensed matter physicists, or solid state physics, as we called it there. So that's one lesson I would say to people, is to stay open-minded. You know, so I decided not only not to do what I'd done in my final year project, which was all about the specific heat of gadolinium and a phase transition in condensed matter. Not only did I not just try to do a PhD in the only thing I knew from my final year project, I decided to try and do a PhD in the things I'd done nothing in. And that may be a bit reckless, but it proved good because eventually I just chose between particle physics and astronomy. I did a cosmology one, which I thought had a bit of both of that in it still was relevant to particle physics. But then I had another crisis of confidence at the end of my PhD and briefly left to go and do teacher training, actually, for school teaching. And decided, actually, I'd done too much investment in training in my physics career. And, but then still, the reason I ended up at Lancashire was that I wanted to do physics teaching at that point more than research. And I gradually kind of drifted back into research almost in my spare time as a hobby. And kind of, I didn't need to do it as part of my job, but I drifted back into it. And gradually that became a bigger thing. And I applied for a lot of telescope time, got a lot of telescope time, made various breakthroughs in astronomy and came back to Edinburgh as a kind of fully fledged half researcher, half lecturer. And decided at that point to accept that what I was doing and stop being stupid and trying to do something else. But yeah, studying the first galaxies was something that came about partly due to a trip, an earlier trip to Canada I made, which was a good advert for moving around a little bit and speaking to some other people. So this move to very high range of astronomy is something I did kind of in collaboration with some people in Canada and people in America of visiting them and realising that. Because before that, I'd done a lot on, on galaxy evolution and on black holes and quasars, but I hadn't got quite so fixated in this idea of just looking for the first galaxies as we have in recent years. But that, that's proven to be a good choice because that's been a, a topical area. So the story is that you kind of make a lot of decisions based on who you meet and what you happen to be doing at the same time. The best thing I did was probably leave research slightly and rediscover research for the fun of it rather than feeling it was a duty. And that was a good thing because that's made me always view the research side of the job as something that you do partly for the, the pleasure. I'm not saying there's not pleasure in teaching, but I think if you lose the fun of research and, and regard it as a chore, you know, I must produce a paper this year or I'm going to be sacked, this sort of attitude, then you're not going to do good research. 
and so it, get, it builds its own momentum. If you're doing good research, you never find yourself sitting around thinking, oh, I must do some research. It's more, can I find the time to do the research I, I'm, I'm itching to do because I've got too many projects on the go and I can't do them all. And that usually also makes for good PhD projects because you usually have lots of ideas that you don't have time to do yourself that are then by definition good projects for other people to work on. And so getting this research teaching balance right is difficult. And people, people's careers go through different phases. There's places where it's all research and you almost resent having to do any teaching. And there's other times where your research maybe slows a bit, maybe when you're waiting for a facility that's long overdue. And then you can maybe decide to put some effort into bringing some of the teaching courses you do up to the, you know, the, the ideal level you'd like to be teaching them at, put in some of the latest research, and you can reinvest in the teaching side, and then maybe you'll get another big grant when the facility is finally approved to push your career maybe more in the research direction for a few years. And so people need to be flexible looking at that as well. You know, the, the nature of your career can change. So I've had times in my career where I did very little research and lots of teaching and other times where I've been almost bought out of teaching completely so that in a crucial few years I can exploit a new facility to do some research. So I think when people look at future academic careers they don't necessarily realise that it can go through different phases and have different flexibilities Mm -hmm. and that you don't know what, you know, you might do a bit of research that turns into a dead end and there might be another bit of research that makes a huge discovery and suddenly it's easy to write the case for more money because your name's first author on this paper that had some breakthrough. And most of that is entirely unpredictable, except you just, just work hard and, and keep an open mind that, that maybe what you're working on is maybe not going to be the best thing in 10 years, so maybe you should dabble a little bit in that in case that turns out to be the big area. Yeah, absolutely. And so kind of coming off the back of that, and all you kind of said, you have mentioned quite a, quite a good range of bits and pieces that maybe undergraduates or just people in general should kind of adhere to, you know, be a bit more flexible and kind of realise the finer details as such of academic life. But what kind of advice would you have for undergraduates currently and specifically undergraduates who might want to go into research, might not necessarily know what they want in the future? What would you kind of say to them and what do you think they should maybe do or just keep in mind whilst they're studying? Okay, well, I would say two main things. One is to try to stay broad. Now, I give an extreme example of me going off to do a PhD that I knew absolutely nothing about. But that can be done because you can sit in an undergraduate lecture. So I I knew no astronomy, so I was trying to learn that. So I sat in in all the fourth and fifth year lectures that were going on, even while I was trying to do my PhD. But stay broad by that. I mean, nowadays, there's quite a lot of opportunities for people to do projects in the latter part of their undergraduate career. So we've been left quite a lot of money by donors now to fund summer projects. There's much more summer projects available for undergraduates, and that's not just for people from other institutions, for Edinburgh undergraduates to do six-week summer projects. So take advantage of that is one piece of advice, I would say. But the other thing is, I get quite annoyed, maybe that's a bit strong, when a student does a summer project in something thinks oh I quite liked working with that person that was quite good so I'll do my senior honours project and the same thing if I can get away with it working with the same person and then I'll go and do my MPhys project and okay it may be an easy route because you're staying in some area and then maybe even we now get quite a lot of people come to do PhDs and they seem to be only interested in doing in a PhD in the same thing they did the or something very close to the final undergraduate project they did and I would say that's entirely the wrong attitude you should try to even if it's maybe slightly harder and feels slightly scarier, if you do a summer project, a senior honours project and a master's project, do them in as broad a range of things as you can think of. Because otherwise you'll never know. You know, you might be doing a computational physics degree, but you could do one project in astrophysics. Why not? Find out if you like it. Try and get some variety because that way you're much better able to look at the landscape of PhD projects, both in the UK and internationally. And you're much better informed to keep an open mind as to what you might like to do. And sometimes people think when they come for a PhD interview that they need to dazzle with their knowledge of one narrow area. That's not really true. When we do PhD interviews, we'll ask the people to say, what do you enjoy in your, in your undergraduate? OK, tell us about that. You know, what course did you enjoy? And we'll be pleased if the project's in one area and maybe their favourite course is in a totally different area. 
because we can pretty quickly in a PhD, you, you know, you're doing your hands on and you're working non-stop in your research, pretty quickly you can build up the technical expertise to do your project. What we can't easily replace is, is the kind of breadth of education and, and curiosity that people should bring into that area. And even once you're in a PhD, you, you need to stay broad, you know, so people say, oh, I can't keep up with the literature, there's too many papers on every day, but you have to, you have to try because some of the best things I've ever done was because I knew I kept quite broad and I would be speaking to somebody, maybe in a totally different research area, but maybe they were using a modelling technique that we could bring into it our research area that had not been tried or vice versa. So that'd be my first piece of advice is, to, is to, to stay broad. And the other piece of advice that I think I was a bit of a coward at various points in my career, and I think I can understand why, but I think I was too worried about becoming labelled as an astrophysicist and being unemployable later. And actually, I think nowadays that's particularly not a worry. So we, we have people leave after PhD or after two postdocs and, and they have no problem. There's no problem with getting into industry because nowadays people need people who've got the skills in modelling or data analysis, data science. So if you even vaguely think you might want to do research, it's worth doing a PhD. And even then, after your PhD, it's worth doing a couple of postdocs to find if you really like it. And you still won't be kind of too old to be employable and your actual career prospects will probably be enhanced by your technical skills. You know, you, you might feel when you join in a company that you're behind them, but you're probably promoted much more rapidly because you bring in this set of skills. So I got good advice from somebody when I was doing this milk ground of job and finding a lot of the physics jobs at the time in the defence industry and I didn't want to do that. Somebody said, if you think of doing a PhD, do it now, because if you don't do it now, you might be less likely later in your life to come back and take the salary drop and things. So the main advice is stay broad. Try not to lock yourself into believing that what you know is all you know because there'll be other opportunities. And if you think you maybe want to pursue physics or science beyond undergraduate level, apply for masters, apply for PhD and do it. You'll still be totally employable even if you decide to move out of pure science at a later date and not to be scared of that. The other thing that gets complicated is you might need to move around a bit in some of these junior science jobs. You know, a lot of the time I could promise any person who got a two one or a first they'll get a PhD, but they might be, have to be prepared to look at a wide range of universities and the postdoctoral positions that, that can be disrupted to your personal life. They're often two or three year jobs. You maybe got to be prepared to go to the states or to Europe for a while. And not always, but you have to be slightly flexible. And so at some point, people have to balance how much do I want to stay in Edinburgh. You know, sometimes mm -hmm. by that point, people are married, they've got kids, or how much am I prepared to move around to keep my science career going? If you if you manage it well, you can usually have the best of all worlds. But that, that's a tension down the line, and that's a tension you can decide based on how much you're enjoying your career by that point. So, yeah, not to be afraid of giving it a go, and not to worry that, you know, some people's parents say, oh, you've got to get a job, you've got to get a job, you know. Well, a PhD, it's, a, it's not the best paid job, but it, it's reasonably well funded, you can can survive and if you're enjoying it you'll go on to quite well paid jobs based on that expertise later so not to be scared of that but equally don't do a PhD just as a soft option because you can't think of something else to do if you're not interested in enjoying physics or astrophysics or theoretical physics or whatever by that point you'll find you'll find a PhD a chore so it has to select out it's not purely about ability. There's lots of people who do Brantley exams. It's, it's a certain bar. You won't get into a PhD unless you're a 2-1 or a 1st. But that actual grading is not, a, not within that band is not a great predictor as to who will go on to be the best research scientist. It's more complicated than that. You have to be able to speak to people. You have to have ideas. You have to, you have to be able to work hard. You have to keep your ear to the ground for what's going on. It's a different skill to pass in an exam. So that's the other thing, you know, if somebody's got a 2-1 and they think, well, people are, they seem to be looking for people with first-class honours, the person with the 2-1 might end up being the better research on the long term, who knows. Yeah, absolutely, and I guess sometimes when you're maybe a bit younger, especially for an undergraduate degree, you might not always be so focused on studying because you are mm -hmm. just that little bit younger, so then you, know, you kind of develop yeah, all these other skills that will make you brilliant in the future as yeah, a researcher. Yeah, and without wanting to discourage study, so <laughs> sometimes <laughs> yes. the people who struggle are the people who are already working flat out, say, as a first-year undergraduate. If you're a first-year graduate, undergraduate and you're getting good grades, but you're doing nothing else with your life but studying 24-7, in other words, if you have no more capacity still to come, 
you probably won't survive as a PhD student. Okay? So you need to work hard, but you, the successful scientist will be the person who was not working at full throttle to pass their first year. Because if that's the case, you're like a small car in top gear who can't go any faster. So people shouldn't beat themselves up about having a social life and, and having some hobbies and, and doing other things in the early years of the degree, because if they can't do that, they're probably doing something they're not well suited to, if that makes sense. <laughs> so as head of the School of Social Autonomy, I should say, you should all work really hard, um, but you need to still have, have more to come, because otherwise it's just going to be too hard. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess getting that balance right is also yeah. extremely important. It's also about using your time effectively. And like all stages in study, if you don't have something to look forward to, whether it's a good night out or going off to play a game of football or go to the fencing class or go to work in your abs in the gym or whatever, if you don't have something to look forward to that focuses your mind to use your two hours you've set aside to study and finish that hand in or whatever, then you're just going to sit there all evening just getting slower and slower. And it doesn't necessarily lead to success. So usual kind of boring advice, short-term deadlines, structure your life. But the other thing is, you know, do do stick it through. The problem with physics, it's a bit of a learn to play the piano. You have to master some good skills or you won't understand the stuff that's fun. So you won't understand the elegance of the standard model of particle physics unless you can do vector calculus, just as you won't be able to play Rachmaninoff unless you can do arpeggios and scales and stuff. So in constructing our syllabuses or syllabi, depending on your Latin, people try to scatter these little tasters of, of high level physics into the lower courses. You know, if you do a first year astronomy course, you'll hear about some cosmology, but there's some relativity and quantum early on in the courses in physics. But it can't be more than a scattering because you have to get the technical skills on board or you will not understand it in fourth year where somebody starts writing lots of you know, vector calculus and gauge and variance equations, assuming that you can do the machinery. So you have to do some spade work and you have to stick with a course like physics and do the maths things. Otherwise, you won't enjoy the high level stuff. You need that machinery on board. And speaking to some people in some other subjects, people just don't understand that there are some things that the, the machinery you have to have. I mean, physics is an art at the top level. But the stuff you need to master before you can be an artist is a lot more, dare I say it, than the stuff you need to master before you can maybe be a good painter or something like that. But even then, the best artists still have mastered a lot of technical skills before they can go on and throw it all away and do some avant-garde art. They tend to learn the boring stuff first. So they don't do avant-garde because they couldn't do accurate portrait paintings because they choose not to do it. Not. So if physics is a bit like that, you should master all the skills before you decide. No one will take you seriously if you come up with a new theory of physics unless you've mastered all the basic physics. So you have to get through the... So my, my message was that I stayed partly through accident. I mean, I could still do it, but I wasn't enjoying a lot of the physics and maths in first and second year because it just seemed like slightly harder versions of the stuff in school. Yeah, and then I know that's kind of what some people do tend to think in their first and second year but I also think it's quite a nice image like what you brought up you know to learn the piano and to learn all the beautiful hard pieces that are really great you have to do the scales and yeah the and a good piano teacher wouldn't order. give you three hours of scales every lesson mm -hmm. but it will have some you know, and the whole, you know, probably if I'd been better at practicing my skills I could have become a better pianist but it's getting that balance right you need enough to be interested and to be honest, you have to also find some satisfaction out in doing the scales right. So you have to hope, hopefully, we have some lecturers who are good enough at teaching these mathematical methods or basic quantum mechanics courses or vector calculus courses that there's some, some satisfaction in themselves of being able to master these techniques. When I say I was a bit bored, but I, I still got some satisfaction at getting good enough at vector calculus to be confident I could do the exam questions, you know? Calculate the electric potential produced by any shape, charged to any whatever, you know? At some level, it's boring, but at some level, it's a skill people need to take pride in. And so if you can take some pride in the technical tools, set the exams and view it as not just exams for their own sake, but legitimate, albeit maybe slightly frustrating tests that you can master these tools, you'll get so much more out of the high-end courses as a result. Yeah, absolutely. And there is, uh, even with the more basic thing, there is kind of a thrill, or well, at least for me, that comes with getting a question right or you know, working on, say, a hand-in and then finally being able to see where the answer comes yes. from. And, you know, if you don't enjoy these little moments 
even at first and second year level, then you're probably doing the wrong subject. That feeling of closure, that realizing, oh, that is the same answer. That, and that you also, if, you, if you're getting good teaching, some people should point out that you've just found the same answer in 20 minutes that it took somebody 100 years ago half their life to get before that bit of physics was properly understood or whatever. So there's also these bits of satisfaction that realising you're not starting from scratch, that you've been given a helping hand up to master a body of material that actually took a long time for some very clever people to assemble. And that's why sometimes it's good if you can read around the subject a little bit and some of the history of physics to understand that that thing that you thought, oh, I was really annoying I had to do 10 lectures and that took somebody 10 years. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and that can give you some reassurance that you're making progress in your life. Right? Yeah, absolutely. It can kind of help put things in perspective as well. And, you know, without sounding arrogant about physics, if you even if you stop at the end of undergraduate level, You'll find in conversations with the vast majority of people you meet later in life that you've got a deeper understanding of quite a lot of stuff and less fear of the world around you, you know, what the hell's going on in my television, than most people, actually. Certainly most politicians. Yeah, for sure. And it gives you that, yeah, that deeper understanding of what is actually going on in the world, which is quite, I guess, nice and something that I've definitely found quite a lot of pleasure in to be able to look around and be like, oh yeah, I know why that behaves the way it does. Or I look and be like, oh, this is doing this because of this. And it sometimes is pain if I've been doing it for, or if I'm in the middle of a semester and I've got deadlines coming up and I don't want to think of physics, but it's kind of nice that I am able to think yeah. that way as well. Yeah, I mean, when you're doing a physics degree, there's lots of times you don't want to think of physics, but what I'm saying is later on you'll probably think, well, there's a lot of things that I assumed everyone in the world knows that they don't do because they don't have not just a physics education, but even a basic science education. I think I think the main thing that a good physics degree teaches you is a belief that if you just apply yourself properly, you can understand things. And actually, lots of people go through the world assuming that most things they can't understand. And that gives you, for some physicists, it makes them dreadfully arrogant. You know, everything is a subsidiary of physics, which is, at some level, is true, of course. But it does give you a certain confidence that you have some idea what's going on. And lots of people stagger through life actually a bit scared of... I mean, Feynman's fam famous quote when he was uh, sitting at dinner when he got the Nobel Prize as one of the members of the, the royal family that are attending the Nobel things, asked him what he'd got his prize for, and he said physics. And, and apparently everyone at the table giggled or something and said, oh, well, we can't really talk about that because nobody understands physics. You know? <laughs> and apparently Feynman said, no, you're right, we can't talk about that because the problem is some people do understand physics. <laughs> <laughs> the implication being that you know the things that most people talk about you talk about because nobody's really an expert so you can all we can all talk about brexit because nobody really understands what will happen and the thing about physics is that some people really do understand physics yeah it's quite a cool subject to study even from our discussion about all the exciting research that is going on it's definitely quite interesting and you know it's very curiosity driven as well and i think that is where some of the excitement definitely comes from, especially for me studying it. And so I kind of want to bring us to our final question of this podcast. It's been absolutely lovely talking to you and hearing about and your you? research. And Probably rambled on way too long, but yeah, okay. <laughs> absolutely, you know, it's great to hear everything that you have to say and to learn a bit more about it. But the final question I have is, do you have any inspirational books or articles to recommend to us? Yeah, so I've gone a bit overboard and I've got two or three suggestions, but they are consistent with two of the things that I said earlier. One is about staying broad and the other is that I think um, it's useful to read around the subject. So when you're maybe fed up checking that you can do all your electromagnetism tutorial or whatever, you can still read some physics, but reading some of the history of some of the science and, and some of the philosophy behind it is a little bit different, but can, can maybe provide some motivation. So I've got a book I would suggest people buy and read, which is slightly biased because it's written by Malcolm Longyear, who was one of my two PhD supervisors when I first came to Edinburgh, and was this guy who had been at Dundee, gone on to Cambridge to work at the Cavendish and then became a son of a here. And he's, he is still around, he's, he's retired but still writing books. He's a kind of inspirational character because he somehow found time to write these books while running the observatory and doing all these other things. He wrote some astronauts books, but maybe consistent with me being a physicist first and an astronomer second, 
the books I like best that you get involved in. So this one's called Theoretical Concepts in Physics. It's by Malcolm Longair, L-O-N-G-A-I-R. Not long hair, long air. And it's got subtitles to hear an alternative view of theoretical reasoning in physics. And this actually came out of a summer course, I think he taught just before people went into their final year in, in Cambridge. But it's perfectly understandable by people at kind of end of second year stage, maybe junior honours stage. It kind of goes through the history of how quite a lot of things like Maxwell's equations or Planck's formula for the black body were were constructed, explaining the struggles that people had, the way that Maxwell came about his things. And it derives quite a lot of results backwards. So it takes you, say, from Maxwell's equation backwards to the things that Maxwell went forwards from, like Ampere's law and all these kind of things. And it's full of... Malcolm was also very interested in digging out the original papers and sort of photocopies of some of the original diagrams and things like that. So seeing some of the background and the struggles of how real scientists went through figuring out what went on from Galileo through. So that's a beautiful book and it gives you a better understanding of some of the physics you'll be doing in the exams anyway. And he wrote one, I've not read it properly, he wrote a, a similar thing quite recently called Quantum Concepts in Physics. And the language is very approachable and a lot of it's quite visual, which is the way I, I like to look at physics. I like to be able to sketch what's going on first and then tackle the mathematics afterwards if it's interesting enough. And the other thing that you would probably recommend people to read, although this is a bigger undertaking and it's not cheap to buy them, are these three big volumes from the 1960s, the so-called Feynman Lectures in Physics which are kind of famous. And actually on YouTube, you can see some of these lectures being given by Feynman. He didn't write it down. One of his colleagues, Ralph Later, I think, actually, you know, they recorded all the lectures and tried to reconstruct the book because Feynman was too lazy, I suppose, to write the lectures out themselves. And they are very approachable and slightly maverick ways of looking at some of the physics that you'll be getting maybe in a more formal way in some of your lectures. And of the strange thing of each lecture starting off sounding almost childlessly easy and somehow in the space of a few pages getting through to the final answer. And then a really fun book, if people want something that's light reading, is this QED, Quantum Electrodynamics Sustained Theory of Light and Matter, which is a little book based on, I think, some lectures that Feynman gave in Brazil for a public audience. So this is like a tiny little penguin paperback, a fiver it says, but that was a few years ago, in which he derives, he shows how you get normal geometric optics like reflection off a mirror or refraction by a lens from the point of view of photons and quantum electrodynamics, which is just a really entertaining way of understanding. I mean, he must have just done it for a bit of a stunt and some of it's slightly gimmicky, but it, it, it's quite entertaining and it shows that you can actually reconcile some of the things you learn in quantum mechanics with why light goes in a straight line and why you get angle of instance equals angle of reflection and stuff like that. So these, these are books that I think give you a wider perspective in physics, help you understand why you're doing what you're doing and, and there's still some fun to be had in it. And if you're interested in some of the kind of interesting personalities and people, I mean, Planck, story of his life is almost a sad story of devoting his whole life. He finally made it, but the struggle to get to Planck's formula for black body, which nowadays we teach in a couple of lectures on the on the board, so it can make you realise you know, how much knowledge has been gained by people's hard work. So that what you're doing is, is not so hard after all. Yeah, absolutely. Those are fantastic recommendations to kind of read and it looks like though definitely help with solidifying the knowledge that we get from courses and keep that interest going when maybe the coursework gets a bit tough going. So yeah, I'm looking forward to kind of picking them up and having a little bit of a look through them. And okay, good. Why do you sound convinced? <laughs> yeah, you probably open it up and say, what was he talking about? <laughs> uh, well... I mean, definitely with some of them. I think they would be quite interesting. I do quite like going through textbooks and I find it a lot easier to grasp the knowledge if I'm kind of going through them and working it all out. I think these kind of books, and they're rather very similar books, and often the introductory chapters of more technical books are good in this regard. It's sometimes really good when you're in the engine room struggling to understand all this stuff to actually be reminded why you're doing it. You know, why did somebody invent all this machinery? You know, why was calculus invented? I do some tutoring of, of school kids now and again in, in their final kind of maths exams at school and you find that they've just been hit with calculus and nobody even said to them why it might be a good idea to be able to calculate the gradient of something over an infinitesimal interval. 
you know, what, why? And then you explain to them, and they go, okay, right, okay, and now I understand why I might think this is interesting, you know. And that's true at all levels in education. If nobody tells you why, and some lecturers, good lecturers will always t- tell you why. They might not tell you why at the beginning. They might give you some technical stuff, and then once they think you're kind of on board, you know, then they'll pause and tell you, right, we're doing this because, or they might give you at the beginning. It's matters of style, but hopefully most of the lecturing you get here in Edinburgh Physics contains some element of why, because if you don't have that, then... So sometimes students can find their own idea of why. So these are books that, if you don't feel you're getting enough why, you get plenty how, but not enough why, you can read some of the surrounding books and think of why. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it would be great for students to kind of figure out the why, because I think it would be helpful to kind of keep them going through their undergraduate degree and through their studies as well. Yeah, so, yeah, thank you for the recommendations and thank you so much for being on this podcast. It's been brilliant to chat with you. Okay, it's been fun. I hope it's helpful to somebody. (laughs) (laughs) Absolutely, I'm sure it will be. (laughs) Thank you. So thank you for listening to this week's episode of Delving Into Academics and I hope you found it interesting. Please like, review, comment and subscribe wherever you're listening to this and if you want to find out more about the researcher I will have their university website page linked in the description. See you in two weeks for another episode.